I've never been slacklining, so I've got to say that right up right up front. I've hung out with some pretty cool slackliners at different events, though, and have really enjoyed spending time with them. Um, I gave a presentation for um, an event called Vertical Connect in Myring in, in Switzerland. I've given two now over the last couple of years, and uh, met Philip and had a really good chat with him while we were there, and it was that was awesome. But look, we were just chatting in the background there with, with Kat um, about a few different things, and one of those was that that term span set. And it just got me thinking because there are many times where there's different names for knots and even anglophones, people that just speak English, they want to argue about the different names of knots. And then you introduce the other language names for knots and it's there is no consistency and that's completely fine. But um, the Spanset one is an interesting one because Spanset is a company and they do make excellent synthetic round slings, but they're not the only company that make these round slings. Um, um, my background is, is, is diverse. Um, originally, I was a rock climber and climbing instructor and canyon guide <clears throat> um, and traveled the world skiing and mountaineering and skiing steep things and falling off some things and hurting myself. But anyways, um, then I got into rope access and industrial rigging. So most of my, my paid work now, about half of that is doing rope access work as an active rope access technician working on the side of buildings and solving interesting problems. But I'm also a licensed rigger, so I work with large cranes and, and moving heavy loads around. And that unique set of skills means that often it involves getting me into a place um, where I can sling a load and then direct the movement of that load with, with the crane and, and the other operators. Now, the, um, the, the term that we would use for these round slings is, is exactly that, synthetic round slings. And that's I only do that work in Australia, so maybe that's my unique my unique awareness of that. But um, I gather it's the same in North America, unless you work in entertainment rigging, and then they call them span sets as well. But span set is um, as I, I guess I just wanted to say it's one it's one name of of that product. Um, look, I'll just flip over to the other camera here because I've got a few interesting bits of kit that I've just thrown together. One of the things we were I, I did mention briefly was these Texora slings. When I was in, in the Netherlands last year, um, working with a friend there, he had a bunch of these and I'd never seen them before. And he go, and, and I said, wow, what are they? And he said, well, they're, they're awesome for us because it is a synthetic round sling. It's incredibly tightly packed. Normally on, on a, a two ton green round sling, I can pinch quite a bit of extra material there, um, but there's almost no room in this. So that's why for such a narrow sling, it still has, if I just open the label and flip it around here, a braking load of 100 kilonewtons. Um, and it's also certified to EN354 and EN795. So that means as a rope access technician, I can use that for PPE to connect my ropes too, which is quite different to what we would normally call um, the, you know, the two ton, the green round slings. They're not PPE, they're manufactured under the machinery directive in Europe and distributed as that. So technically, on a rope access site, I shouldn't be using industrial round slings to attach people to unless they're certified to this standard here, to the to one of those two, 795 or 354. Um, so look, I, I, I don't know slacklining and I don't pretend to know very much about it at all. But from the description of, of the anchoring that, that I've just heard, to me, it would make more sense um, with the one exception that Kat mentioned, and that it's what you're doing around trees it would make more sense to consider something like this, uh, particularly if people are using smaller shackles and carabiners, because as, as we can see, that round sling in that carabiner, it's, it's pretty much the same as any other bit of webbing or, or rope connection that we'd put in there. Um, I don't get any commissions or I'm not sponsored by any manufacturers or anything. So, you know, if, if I make statements like that, it's not because, you know, for the, I think it was seven euros, um, that, that my friend said, you know, when, when I said to him in the Netherlands, well, wow, can I buy one from you? And he just said, oh, it's only like five euros or seven euros. Just just have it, you know. So I, I brought it home with me to to use on a few different jobs. But that's that's an interesting example of, you know, there, there are things going on. And it's the same as, um, have I got any here? No, I haven't got any of the kingpins here. But, you know, it's that same look that I get sometimes when I pull those out on different sites, even though technically they're not approved to use on a, on a work site, just the idea of an aluminium shackle that, that has a, a removable locking pin. Um, the other one that I'd be interesting to explore and from, um, look, it's, it's, it's almost my bedtime here, so I didn't see too many of the, 
I didn't see too many of the presentations yesterday um, and, and I won't be up too much longer here as well because I've got a four o'clock start in the morning. But um, talking about load limiting and, and, and options for, for, for limiting the peak forces on anchors, I mean, that, that's common across, across all users and we spoke a bit about screamers. Um, and again, just coming back to the naming of things. So this, um, this is made by Yates, by John Yates in the US. And this is um, this is a and Yates first started using that term screamer, and the idea was that as a rock climber or as an ice climber, so particularly if you're aid climbing on marginal placements, and you have a fall, um, whether the origin of the term is because you scream in fear as you're falling for the the doubt of whether that piece that you just placed is going to hold or not, um, or otherwise, the idea was. With um with with the screamer like this, and I can't open that one up. If I got, I did have a really old one here as well. I don't have it just handy, but it is. It's not. I mean, it's much like bar tacking. And the early ones, I think John basically sewed on his mum's sewing machine. You know, and you can see that as that deploys, these zigzag stitches are going to tear gradually. And even when all of those stitches tear, and this is one of the longest commercial ones that John makes. It's still a 22 kilonewton full length sling. So even with all that stitching torn, it's still a it's still a 22 kilonewtons at its full length. John makes a, a whole range of different ones of these. These are really consistent. You know, you look at the stitching and you think, wow, it starts and finishes at different places and they're not the same with the part. And you know, you'd think maybe the quality could be a little bit better. But I've pull tested a bunch of these on my test bench. And they're remarkable, like it's between 2 and 2.2 .2 kilonewtons that these tear. Yeah, so 2 to 220 kilograms of force. That's not enough. Like you put that on, a, on, a, uh, on some of the lines, the tight lines, if you guys are walking tight lines, you'd, you'd, you'd be tearing that straight away. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing wrong with ganging two of these together in parallel. So if I put two of those together now, that goes up to four to four and a half kilonewtons as an activation force. And in terms of how far it can deploy, again, if I want more length, I could just add some more in series. So even if they're not the, the rating that you're after or the length of deployment that you're after, there's, there's nothing at all wrong with, with combining them in either parallel to double the activation force or in series to double the activation length. Um, those ones are that sort of two to two and a half kilonewtons. The more traditional Petzl ASAP Sorber 20s and 40s and all 57s like the ones that we'd use on the ASAPs. Slightly different mechanism with the, the way the webbing's constructed and the way they tear out. These, these deploy around four to four and a half kilonewtons. But again, if I want to make it longer, I could add two together or I could put two in parallel um, to, to, you know, to, to let me predetermine what rates I want those to tear at. So, I mean, it's for for me incorporating incorporating force limiting elements in components is uh, in systems is a really important part of what I do because I don't know what anchor strengths I've got. Typically, I'll go for a twelve kilonewton minimum anchor strength, regardless of the discipline that I'm working. And the way I work at that is all of these backup devices that typically we use they have a six kilonewton maximum force that they can depart, um, impart on the system before they reach full length. So I guess if I think about a job that I was asked to do a little while ago, um, so you guys probably get this more than most people that I talk to, but um, there's, there's um, you guys are slackline walkers. There's also wire walkers like the Wallenders that, that walk on a tensioned wire. And then there are people that walk on tensioned wires with balance bars as well. And there's quite a bit of difference between each of those. But, um, there was a guy that wanted to wire walk a wire between two buildings in Sydney as part of a TV series that I was helping with the filming of. And, um, you know, they were doing all the practice for it and everything. And, and, and with this building, there were a couple of, there were already a bunch of bolts that they wanted to tie together to anchor at each end. And they were going to use a turfer, like a, um, a, a flexible steel wire rope tensioned wire with a lever block to tension it. Um, and, and I said, well, what's the maximum force you're going to put on the anchors? And they said, oh, they'll be fine. And I said, well, no, that's, it's, it's, it's not like I need my training. I'm an engineer. I'm a qualified engineer as well as the other stuff that I do. I said, I need more than that before I can look that building owner in the eye and say, you know, we're not going to damage the building. We're not going to damage the bolts. And the window cleaners can keep using them when, you know, when we're finished. 
um, but they couldn't answer the question. So I said, well, look, for the guy that's doing the wire walk, if, if we could, because it's wires, so there's very minimal stretch, we don't have to allow for extra sag when he falls. Um, if we can incorporate something like one of these, these L57 units, in his lanyard that is running from his sit harness uh, to, to, to a ring that he was dragging along the wire behind him, then that now means I know that he cannot put more than six kilonewtons of force mid-span on that wire. And a force applied mid-span for equal height anchors, um, that, that's the worst possible um, force magnification on the endpoint. So it's great to hear Lorenzo say that the infinite multiple, multiplier is not possible because we can never get 180 degrees, of course. Um, we always get some sag. But if we then have that six kilonewtons and I can look at the sag that I can measure by applying the tension in that wire rope, then I can calculate the force that I'm going to, the, the maximum possible force that I would have on the anchors at the end. But look, that's, um, that, that's just some of, the, some of the, the takes from someone who doesn't do what you guys do, having, having heard a few of the conversations. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the other couple of bits of kit, I'll just go back to the camera in front here, that maybe you have or have not seen, if I think about in terms of application, this is something, um, this is the first time that any companies convinced me to actually consider taking some money for one of my ideas. Normally I've tried really hard to avoid any commercial association with any manufacturer, um, but I'm just so frustrated with the way people consider rope and edge protection. Um, the Typically they just lump them into one thing. I work on a lot of buildings with very sensitive architectural features. Um, and if I have my ropes running over that soft edge and I damage the edge, then I have to pay for the repair of that work. So edge protection, I guess like you guys would talk about tree protection, it's a different category to, to rope or line protection. But I thought I've got to be able to make a better edge protector using off the shelf parts. So the first one I made, which again, I haven't just, I'm so poorly prepared, I haven't got right with me. Um, this here, yeah, yeah, so that's right. So this is skateboard wheel ball bearings. So they're so cheap and easy to buy. Um, the one that I made, I just got aluminium um, pieces of metal from the local hardware store. I didn't have these cutouts in them and I just bolted a bunch of them together with high tensile bolts. And then that as a, as a piece to sit on an edge, um, it, it just, it sits beautifully over almost any edge that I've tried. And it means that with ropes running over there, I could have two ropes running in different directions one stationary and one moving because all of you can't see it with the camera, but all of these bearings spin freely in different directions. Um, so, you know, people often talk about with rescue scenarios, do you have to approach the person to rescue them or can you do it remotely? One of the biggest issues is often the edge friction because a rope running over an edge with no low friction elements, it effectively doubles the mass of what you're trying to haul. Um, so by having this running over that edge, it now makes my top up rescues a whole lot easier. So look, that's, it's one of the final pre-production prototypes that just arrived in the mail for me for DMM two days ago. Um, it's still got a bit of tweaking to get it, to get it perfect, but the IP on this is unprotectable. It's too simple to make. It's too easy. So look, if you want to go and do something like there's nothing to stop you making that yourselves, like the consequence of failure, worst case, you've just got the rope or the the, the webbing lying on the edge that you already had. Um, so look, there's a bunch of things. And, and for me, it is like, it's, it's, it's not just about rope and edge protection. This, this is about part of my rescue plan as well. It is a pulley. It's a low friction interface that sits right at the edge. Um, so there's that device. Look, just because I'm unfamiliar with this, this interface, I'm just gonna open up the, um, the chat page because uh, I can see, I've just noticed a couple of comments pop up. Um, uh, Spanset means in German literally just means tensioning kit. It's also yeah, and it is a brand. Um, windsurfer and sailboard is another one of those. So the windsurfer is is a brand. The sailboard is the generic term, and there are many examples of that. Chris, glad to see a screamer in that rig. <laughs> uh, and you watched that. You watched. You saw that footage of Todd taking that fall as well, potentially. Um, Todd Sampson was the guy that was doing this this series. Um, Double webbing pulley along. Look, this, 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 this device here. I'm not sure what DMM will call it. The marketing and all that sort of stuff is up to them. As I say, look, they will be paying me a commission on that. 
I'm uncomfortable saying it. I've never, like I've been completely independent with every, every other product I've ever had anything to do with. And there are many products on the market that I've, I've given different bits of advice on and, and involved with the testing of. But look, um, I, that would be, I, I, haven't, I haven't asked them to do any testing on it end to end like that. I've got no idea if I could have that on an anchor and then and then you'd be using that as a you know a stacked series of pulleys, but um, you know they're the sorts of things that we need to look at in terms of other misuses, foreseeable misuses that people might try and try and come up with, yeah, and which is always one of the manufacturer's concerns. Um, the as you probably gathered, like. Um, I've really missed traveling and presenting at different things. I've been locked down. Normally I would have traveled five times overseas by, by now. Um, I can talk about this shit for ages and I could, but look, I probably just should. I haven't even been watching the time, but if you guys have got any questions, like treat this as a free, a free for all, like, you know, I haven't got any secrets, any, any questions that you want to ask about any of the stuff that you might've seen me doing, whether you want to type them or whether you want to, Want to put your microphone on and ask me a question and make me feel like there's other people in the room and, and everything is good and, and on the on the plate. Um, I'll just pause for a minute if there's a question. If there's not, then I'll launch into a couple of other things as well. Hi, Richard. Here's Thomas. Great to have hey, you on the talk here. Hello. I've enjoyed um, the interactions that we've had uh, over emails and stuff too. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to also to you. Um, I have a brief question. I would like to hear your take on the PPE question concerning highlining. Um, we've had quite some talks with the UAA Safety Commission on this and it's mostly the test labs who uh, are opposing us on this question, not so much the Safety Commission itself. Um, basically, um, we wrote a first draft of a highline system standard. I just posted it in the, in the chat. And um, basically, we're trying to define um, our system not as a PPE system, but in relation to a temporary installation in reference to um, EN15567. So th that's the climbing courses and the uh, ropes courses standard. And basically, what we are doing there is we're saying, well, we are a temporary installation. We're not um, PPE. We're not like our equipment we have on our, in our setups is not personal, first of all. It's not uh, used by an individual, but used by a group of people, as also is the leash. So even, even the lanyard we use uh, connected to our line is actually not a personal thing, so it belongs to the temporary installation. Could you maybe just give us um, your, your take on this stance of ours on um, PPE or not PPE when, when it comes to island systems? Yeah, um, I have to say up front, I, I, as much as I love Europe and spending time there, I don't know very much about European legislation. Um, I, I wish I knew more. Um, and, and it seems to be very black and white for areas that, um, it, that it suits. So the difference between, and I often talk about, and some of you have already heard me, I know just looking at the names here, the difference um, like in Sydney, uh, on any number of rope access sites tomorrow, there'll be people on site, probably three or four different sites that are using tripods, constructed tripods like the Arizona Vortex and powered winches like the AxSafe ones and others, uh, and 11 millimeter kern mantle rope and carabiners. And they'll be using that system to lift glass and sign to install and signs to install on the sides of buildings. Um, and it's, um, and I've done that, and I do it. I'm a licensed rigger, and I can make those decisions about the way those things work as well for, for high-risk work in Australia. But um, it, I'm also very nervous about it because if I, if I look at things from a European perspective and even from a legislative, legislative perspective in Australia, there's a very big difference between personal protective equipment for fall, pre fall, prevent, fall prevention and industrial lifting equipment. Um, and, and the machinery directive and the PPE directive make those very clear uh, in Europe and the standards to which things need to be certified. Um, so does that mean that we should not be using 11 millimeter rope to lift signs up onto the side of buildings? Technically, I think it does. Um, and even though I have done it many times, I don't think we should be doing it. The challenge comes, I mean, rope access is easy because it's, it's work, it's hard work. Um, 
it, it's, um, it's not fun. It's not something I would choose to do in my spare time. I charge a lot of money for it because it's hard work, you know, and, and it's using heavy tools and, and in dangerous places. Um, so it's very easy to say that that's work. You're getting paid for it and it comes under acts and legislation and regulations. Um, recreational activities, unless they're guided activities, um, they're generally something completely different. And have I got one just, I don't have one just here, but it was um, Black Diamond uh, as a manufacturer, for example. They're very clear on their carabiners and all of their equipment that they say for climbing and mountaineering use only. Some people still try to take Black Diamond carabiners onto work sites, but they're not certified under any of the, um, any of the PPE standards. So technically they shouldn't. They're the same carabiner, and if I look at um, uh, you know, any of these other carabiners that I've got in front of me, like this, this DMM one, that's certified to a, a PPE standard and to a recreational climbing mount, mountaineering standard. Yeah? So for that, that one, it's easy. Um, there, are, there are many gaps, though. Um, uh, Walter, I know you're very familiar with, with Challenge Ropes courses, and that's a really good example because it's a recreational activity like the people that are doing it are doing it for fun, it's not for work. However, the people that are working there and facilitating that activity, they're definitely at work. Um, maybe they're guiding that experience, so it's not technically doing a, a task suspended by rope. Um, but what about at the end of that activity after the participant's gone and they're doing the post or the pre-activity inspection of the course? Or then what about someone else like me or like Walter who, who maybe is engaged by one of those facilities to come and do their annual or their six monthly inspection of that facility. That is, that is now much more on the side of this is work and I should be, should be considering that the equipment I use comes under that PP directive. But then I look at the equipment that's used on, on that course and um, bow shackles, flexible steel wire rope, um, industrial round slings, they're, they're being, um, you know, they're there um, and they've come from that machinery directive catalog of equipment that being used on activities where people are using PPE. So those sort of, the, so the challenge rope courses, the slacklining stuff that you guys are doing, um, it, that's always going to be the challenge for you. And the, the, one, the one bit of advice that I would give really strongly would be to try and stick with the mountaineering climbing standard side of things rather than the PPE standards. Um, I think you'll find that path far more easy and, and looking at the UIAA um, for assistance with that stuff. But I, I, haven't, I haven't looked into it. I'm embarrassed to say that you have asked me for, um, for input on the standards, but I haven't had the chance to look through those. Um, I, I will make the effort though. <laughs> I hope that helps. Some. Thanks a lot for those inputs. So I think we're exactly as you're describing, we're right in between, right? So we use for all access and rigging, we use all our personal gear certified to you know, normal PPE stuff, but then all our installations basically are on a different, um, our different class of things. It's, it's very close to, to the um, ropes courses, rigging, um, recreational ropes courses, rigging and gear stuff. So, as you saw, we use lots of shackles and planes and we use uh, stuff under the machinery directory. So, so I think we will always be somewhere in between there. And um, that's why we've leaned our own standard on what a Highland system is, a Highland black line system is. Um, we've leaned that onto those ropes course standards, EN standards, where we basically have a loophole um, where we are a, a temporary system um, and it falls under an EN. I'm, I'm sure yeah, that's yeah. the best part for you. Yeah. Um, and then the other got, side of it. We've got a ridiculous situation here in Australia. And I, I don't know if it's the same in other countries, but um, the Petzl distributor here, they, they will, um, they've got two catalogs as they do internationally. There's the professional catalog and then there's the recreational activities catalog. Um, and no shop in Australia can sell products from both catalogs. Except Bogong, yeah. Oh, there you go, I didn't know that. <laughs> Don't tell anyone, they must have snuck that through. <laughs> yeah, um, actually maybe Southern Cross does as well, but normally they, they want to separate it. So you'll have people who run Challenge Ropes courses, they say we need to get new harnesses, new helmets, new lanyards, new carabiners, 
and they want to buy some things from the recreational catalog and some things from the, the professional catalog, and they end up having to split the order to buy from two separate separate providers. Um, any other questions? Uh, minimum safety factor acceptable for high lines. Safety factors is um, one of my passionate topics of conversation, and I, I, I could talk about it for an hour, but I'll give you the I'll give you the one minute version, or I'll try and keep it to one minute. Um, so a helicopter, the factor of safety for a helicopter as a system, it's between one and two, or you know most most flying machines, it's around between two and two and a half as a maximum. Um, why is that? simply that, that if you had a higher factor of safety requirement for all of those components, it'd be too heavy to get off the ground or its, it's capacity to carry loads would be too light, yeah? Um, the, the, how do they manage that so that we don't have these machines falling out of the sky all of the time because of mechanical failure? Um, you've probably heard the term three sigma MBS um, to determine the minimum braking strain of a piece of equipment. And I know that um, DMM, I think DMM was the first manufacturer to use that system for the ratings of their equipment. Um, they, they, they batch test a bunch of these and pull them to failure. They get the average that they broke at, and then they look at the standard deviation. Like they won't all break at exactly the same value. So they look at how far above or below that average they broke. And statistically, they determine this value called the standard deviation. And then they multiply that by three and subtract three standard deviations from that average. And that's the number they print on the carabiners. What that means is they're saying that with 99.7% certainty, this 24, is this 24? Uh, this 25 kilonewton carabiner, 99.7 of those will break above 25 kilonewtons when they're brand new. Statistically, one and a half in a thousand could break less than that, but they should be above that. Um, when it comes to aircraft components, they might use a higher standard. They might use six sigma, so they'll take off six standard deviations. So it'll be 99.994% or some much higher level of confidence in the equipment. Um, entertainment riggers and, and other people often claim to require, and firefighters, um, that they need a factor of safety of 10 for their systems. And that is just not achievable if they're realistic in the way they do their calculations. Um, they, they say we don't need to derate for knots because we've got such a high factor of safety in our systems. Um, I would much rather, and if I put if I put my industrial rigging hat on, um, and as you know, the rope access guys often look at the industrial riggers, the guys that work with cranes, like they're our dumb cousins. They just lift heavy things. They don't have to think about it. Yeah. Um, but the, the reality is when, when, when the guys working with the crane slings, the green and purple ones of these, um, they know that they just have to check the sling and it says, if that's a two ton sling, this one isn't, but if that's a two ton sling, I know that if I put it in basket, it's now a four ton sling. Or if I choke it, that two ton sling becomes a 1.6 ton, I derate de de it to 80% of its value. So they just know to do that. I think we overthink too many things with the things we do with rope and, and webbing. Um, and we just need to apply some really simple rules to it. And we don't really need to know what the minimum braking strength is. I think the working load limit would be far better for us to work with. And if you just say the working load limit is this value and that's what you always stick with, the calculations become really simple. Um, so what factor of safety is the minimum that, that, that I, I think we should work with? If we're realistic in our calculations, I'm happy with two to two and a half, which is why I said for my anchor strength before, I want 12 kilonewton anchors because my maximum arrest force in a dynamic situation should be six kilonewtons because I have a, I have a force limiting component in my systems. So as long as I can guarantee what my maximum force is, then, then I'm happy to do those calculations in the field. And they can be really simple. Um, I, I can argue all day why I think knots should be just, you know, forget about arguing about which knots are stronger and all that sort of stuff. I just say all knots are 50%. So if I've got a 30 kilonewton piece of rope and I put any knot in it, it's now a 15 kilonewton piece of rope. And I'd say the same with webbing. Um, there might be a few exceptions where I'd derate that even more um, because of that potential to tear the edge like a piece of paper that some knots, if you like a, an EDK, you go, I've jumped straight into a term, but the, um, 
do you guys call it a European death knot? I don't know. <laughs> I know in French they don't call it a French prussic. But if I if I was to join, um, and I'll flip to the other camera, if I was to join um, a rope like like this, and look at the strength of it, look, there's all sorts of theories around that. Um, I'm happy to use that for many things, um, but I'm just going to call that a 50% knot. If I did that in in webbing. Because of the way that the webbing is exiting the knot, it's going to tend to tear the edge of it. So that would be more than a 50% reduction in strength. Um, it will depend on the orientation and the thickness of the webbing and a bunch of other things. Um, but that's, that's yeah. So so the, that was a, a a bit more than one, one minute, but um, my, my short take on factors of safety. I'm happy with two to two and a half so long as we're realistic so long as we're realistic in the way we calculate what our maximum anticipated forces are in our systems. And I think that's the critical point actually with Highland systems because estimating the, the peak force is going to depend on so many factors. So yeah. uh, there's yeah. lots of measures, measurements out there on Highland systems and what peak forces could be, but usually these uh, measurements don't describe, you know, the, the circumstances uh, good enough. So we have measurements peak forces reaching to up to more than 20 kilonewton. Uh, in online videos, you see up to four to six kilonewton. So it heavily depends on your rig and how you do it, yeah. and the, the weight of the person and so on. So that's where it gets very, really critical for us. And we, we have to yeah, probably the, work with higher safety yeah. factors there. <laughs> the, the ridiculous forces. <laughs> I mean, if, if you know, again, if that's your known anticipated maximum force, then you work with a safety factor on top of that. If you know you've got a maximum anticipated force of, of 40 kilonewtons, then to put a safety factor of two on that, then you need an 80 kilonewton system. You know, it's that that's the, the way that I'd be looking at that calculation. Working from the maximum <coughs> anticipated force. Yeah. Do we Hi, have Richard. time for it's one nice more to, question? It's nice to see you. I, I think that's the just following from what Thomas said, that's that's one of the struggles though, is getting an accurate anticipation of the maximum force because i think more much more in slack lining than rope access or uh, sort of general rigging there's a reliance on empirical testing and sort of general rules and that's still still being built upon especially as new materials and techniques are being developed so the ability to pre-calculate forces is is uh, much lower and a much more of a reliance on Sort of looking at what's happened before and and applying general rules. So so perhaps a slightly higher safety yeah. safety factor works. Yeah, um, and the same comes in with the circus guys that I work with and talk with. You know, when they're looking at people dropping on silks and and different things in entertainment rigging scenarios and um, e extremely competent acrobats with amazing bodies and core strength, the the peak forces that they can tolerate and impart on their systems. It's it's far beyond what most of us would consider to be survivable forces, you know, and it's um, like I, I know I was involved in a court case where a guy fell off a challenge ropes course um, and, and it was an incredibly compliant system. It was a tree based course that the canopies of the trees moved together during that impact, um, which meant that the droop in that central attachment port, port point dropped even more as a dynamic climbing rope. Um, but uh, and the maximum force on his body was less than four kilonewtons. I'm sure of that, but it still resulted in him um, breaking L4 and L5 in his spine. He's walking, but needs a stick. He's in pain, and he's you know on medication for the rest of his life. So, you know what? It, which which I guess maybe for festivals, like I get that that's a really tricky area for you guys. What you go out and do as a bunch of friends in your own time with your own equipment is one thing, but if you're if you're setting up festival lines and you've got random people coming in and hopping on these lines and, and trying things like that that's where you must be concerned about some of that stuff yeah yeah but that the unknowns the unquantifiables and that's why with todd walking walking that line i said for this thing i need him to incorporate a force limiting component into the system so that i can be sure of it but they're scary forces and i was glad to hear chris talk about before you know if he's pulling things to to that hard in a test bench um Having that much stored energy in systems that have got any elongation in them is, is a is a scary, scary thing to be dealing with. Yeah. How are we going? Uh, do you have time for one more question? 
I, I don't know what time limit I've got. Cat's nodding yes, so I'll take that as a yes, Ali. All good. Um, all right. Um, and um, I'm coming from a climbing background, and uh, most of the aluminium carabiners we're using have the MBS printed on them, the 22, 24 kilonewton. Uh, yeah. But I read in multiple sources, including your book, the FedEx of Rob Technician, that um, if you are maintaining, let's say, a five to one safety factor, and then you get a load of, let's say, 12 kilonewton on this aluminium carabiner, you take this carabiner out of the system and consider it for retirement. So I'm yeah. wondering, how do you consider the... Uh, how do you calculate the safe working load of those aluminium carabiner? And as a climber or as a high liner, if you happen to use those 30 kN or 25 kN in your system, uh, when do you retire them and uh, how do you calculate that? Yeah, thanks. That's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, the, the, the one place where, where this, this is printed by a manufacturer of carabiners is by Kong from Italy. And, and I've spoken to the guys from, from Kong about this, and they're, they're very good friends. And I said, so why is it in, your, in the manufacturer's instructions for all of the Kong hardware, they actually say that it's a, a a, it, it's a retirement specification. So if, if a carabiner or any of their pieces of hardware, if you knowingly exceed 25% of the MBS, then you should remove that piece of equipment from service. That's in their general instructions for all of Kong's equipment. Yep. Um, why do they say 25%? That's what I asked um, Ettore, Ettore Tonya, if anyone knows, knows Ettore who works at Kong. He's, he's great and very approachable if you ever see him at a festival or something. Um, and he said, look, he, he didn't know. He's been working there for a long time, but it's been in there even before that. But um, from, the, from the, 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 the limited amount of fatigue testing I've done, on aluminium carabiners because aluminium carabiners is what I use mostly, and the fatigue uh, the fatigue limit is it accumulates far worse in aluminium than in steel. Um, what that means is that if I have if I have this aluminium carabiner, I'll go to the other go to the other camera again. If I've got this aluminium carabiner and I stretch that and I relax and stretch and relax and stretch and relax. Um, if, if I only pull that to two kilonewtons, how many times can I do that? And if I only pull it to two kilonewtons, will it eventually break? Um, it will, or maybe not at two kilonewtons, but, but there is a number that we can reach. What I do know for sure, and I happen to have this set of carabiners right here, these carabiners made by CT, Climbing Technology, um, who make a lot of hardware for a lot of different companies. and and have done for a long time. Um, that other, I can't see it, it doesn't matter. Um, but these carabiners are all the same model. They're not from the same batch, but they're all the same model. Um, this one here is, is the shape they should all be. I'll just zoom in a little bit more. Um, that's the shape they should all be. I hand these around when I do PPE inspection courses as well. Um, and um, I, I guarantee that any time I give someone, say, that carabiner there to inspect, they'll do a thorough visual and functional inspection by a competent person, and they will determine that that carabiner will pass that inspection. 100% um, of people that I've given that to have passed it. What worries me is that a significant number of people that I've given this carabiner to have also passed this carabiner. It seems to work. There's no, apart from this engraving on the gate, um, it's not a locking carabiner, so I probably shouldn't be using it for PPE. But if I had to inspect that carabiner, I'd use it. When I was a young rock climber, if I'd found that at the base of the crag, I would have thought, fantastic, that's a free carabiner and I'll pick it up and I'll put it on my harness and I'll use it next week. Um, but what I don't know, unless I'm very familiar with that exact model, when I put these two carabiners next to each other, this one has been stretched. It's much shorter in this dimension and longer in this one than this one here. Um, uh, that, that's the, um, this is an even more extreme example of it, this one here. You can see how much that carabiner has been stretched. So these carabiners, the MBS on them is 22 kilonewtons. 
what I've engraved on the gate is the load that I've applied these um, applied to these on my test rig um, and then then let that force go and then engrave that on the gate so this one here was loaded to 22.43 kilonewtons sorry the reflection's a bit hard to read that one to 23.32 so they're both above the MBS right but they didn't break but they've undergone plastic deformation it's not elastic deformation it's plastic deformation elastic deformation we all know I can stretch that carabiner even just between my fingers and I let go and it goes back to its original shape. Now, then these are um, 7,000 series, 7075 T6 aluminium carabiners, um, which is what most, most lightweight aluminium carabiners are made from, um, which also plays into that thing. People are often surprised that aluminium does stretch. It really does stretch. It doesn't just suddenly snap with no warning. Um, it, it does stretch and certainly worn before it's going to break. Um, but the question that should come from you, from you guys is, if I look at this carabiner here, this one I've loaded to 18.3 kilonewtons. And you would pass that in an inspection. It looks as good as new. It looks the same shape. It's only if I measure this precisely with an instrument between here and here that I can see that it is slightly narrower than this one. 18.3 kilonewtons. So that's about 80% of its MBS. We've hit 80% of the MBS and it has undergone some irreversible or plastic deformation. So where is that line? This one here at 15 kilonewtons. Um, look, I'm not satisfied with the way I measure it that it has changed. I, I did measure that it is slightly narrower there and a little bit longer there. So it has undergone a very like less than 1%. Um, from its original shape but even at 15 kilonewtons it it would be correct to say that has undergone some plastic deformation now even before you get to plastic deformation when you're still in that range of elastic deformation you're still significantly fatiguing that component just like if you try and do 100 chin-ups your muscles fatigue the materials fatigue it's a poor example um, but as an analogy but it's it's similar yeah the material fatigues and aluminium in very simple layman's terms has a much longer memory for that fatigue than steel steel you can still fatigue but aluminium accumulates that fatigue um, uh, um, more readily <clears throat> um, the a concrete example of, of, of what i did to test that and fatigue testing is like i'd love to do more of it but it takes forever um, because we're talking hundreds of cycles and tying up a test bed to do that. But this is one of these metolius, I'll just take all these slings off, little metolius 22 kilonewton wire gate carabiners. Um, I, I did a bunch of these on, on, a, on a cyclic testing machine and we loaded these to 75% of their MBS. So it's a 22 kilonewton, I think we loaded it to 17 and a half kilonewtons. Um, let it relax for 30 seconds and then did it again. Let it relax for 30 seconds and did it again. So over and over and over, we're loading that to 80% of its MBS. And it broke at about 400 cycles. So it broke below its MBS, but it held 400 cycles. So I tried to stay under that range. It did undergo a little bit of plastic deformation in the first application of that force, but almost none in the subsequent um, pulls. Um, it took 12 hours to do that test, by the way, um, which is why it's really difficult to do. Like it, that was that machine was a, a 50,000 euro machine that we tied up for 12 hours. Um, it's pretty hard to get get time on those machines to do more of those. So that that um, 400 cycles. I asked Fred Hall at DMM, you know, how many this, you know, these sort of carabiners that DMM make, how many cycles can you load those for with, you know, reasonable use as PPE? And he goes, I don't, the honest answer is I don't know. But what I will guarantee is that that, from opening and closing that, will fail long before you reach the number of cycles for cyclic loading in normal use. And I thought that, 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 was, a, that was a pretty cool idea. Um, so, look, this is the rather, I, I hope you're not regretting answer, asking the question, Ali, because it's the, it's the very long answer to it, but it's the only way I can give the answer. What I do know is that if I go to 75% of the MBS, then I have changed that carabiner and I've reduced its life significantly. 
Where do I come down from 75% to say that by cyclic loading with normal use, I'm not going to reduce that life? Kong say it's 25%. If you stay under 25%, you're not going to shorten the usable life of that connector. You can use it forever as long as it passes an inspection. Yeah. So 25% is what Kong say. That's good enough for me. I've asked other manufacturers. I've asked um, I've asked Petzl. I've asked Rock Exotica. I've asked SMC what their take on all, and many of the big manufacturers. And they've all said, yep, 25%. And I say, well, why don't you write it in your instructions? And they say, well, we're nervous that if we write that in, in our instructions that people will think, our, if we're the first ones, people will think our carabiners are no longer as good as the others, so they'll buy the other ones instead. So the marketing guys have a big say in all of that stuff as well. Um, yes, Lorenzo, aluminium unfortunately has no indefinite fatigue life like steel. Absolutely. That's saying it in, in very short words. Um, for, for what I just took 10 minutes to explain. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the, the other, I guess the other brief thing I'd like to say, like these, these components here are made from 7,000. Um, I think all of them 70, 75 um, aluminium uh, with a T6 uh, heat treatment to it. Aluminium is not just aluminium and, and steel is not just steel. Um, Every different component that we have, and if I look at, you know, there's here's a couple of different mayons here. This one is, is, is a galvanized steel. This one is a stainless steel. I don't know if it's 316. I heard an interesting comment from someone on the UIA Safety Commission who's an excellent metallurgist and materials scientist. Something like 75% of the 316 stainless steel that's sold on the planet is not actually 316 stainless steel. Okay, they get a lot more money for it if they write 316 on it. So there's, there's a, which is why most manufacturers of PPE, every single piece that they get into the plant, they will hardness test that, that piece of metal before they put it through their system to make the components. Um, but look, so they're both steel, but they're very different steels in their properties. The stainless steel, I would, I would guess, is more brittle than the, the galvanized steel one here. Um, same with the different aluminiums. We can have different heat treatments to the aluminiums and we can have different alloys that make those aluminiums up. So, so they're not all the same in their properties. Um, cool, there's a bunch of great comments coming up there as well. A lot of cycles way quickly. Thanks, Sarah. Yep, yep. Um, there was uh, the Petzl, Walter, you might know more about this one. Was it a Petzl tandem speed pulley that used to come with a an aluminium carabiner um, and there was a um, it looked like they had a carabiner that just with normal use on a flying fox on a zip line um, the carabiner seemed to fail under normal use and it had been used many many it wasn't a catastrophic failure because they had a redundant connection in the system um, but just just because during um, I got any I haven't got one here but any time you have any zip line type activity, of course, on a flexible steel wire rope, a steel cable, as that pulley wheel is running down that cable, it's brrrr, and it's bouncing up and down at a microscopic level. So that is um, is part of that fatigue. And the only the, so they had that carabiner that was attached to this tandem speed pulley. It actually failed, knowing that it had never had more than a two person weight applied to it, but it had seen many like tens if not hundreds maybe millions of cycles of loading as it's running down this um this zip line every day on, on this challenge ropes course so they changed the carabiner for those systems to be steel um there is um if someone sends me an email i, I won't be able to do it tonight but petzl did write up a notice about that and why they changed that to to a steel connector on their there is an adventure park section of their website as opposed to the professional or the sport one it's pretty hard to find, but they did write that up in there as well. One of the few technical examples of fatigue uh, influencing. Uh, Chinese stainless shackles, what everybody uses in the slackline world. <clears throat> um, I'll talk really briefly about a point of origin or, or, or origin of, of pieces that we buy and that we use. Um, I, I was at A plus A, the big um, height safety trade show that was in Dusseldorf two years ago. 
And there was a big, I won't name the company there, but one of the biggest stands there that had more carabiners than you've ever seen in your life hung up on all, all the walls. And I was looking at them thinking, wow, they look really familiar, like, like most of the ones that I've seen, but just a little bit different. And I was looking at one and, and this guy walks up to me and said, do you like that one? And I said, yeah. And, and he goes, what would, you, what would you think of using it for? And I said, well, for, for this. And he goes, I can make that for you. What would you like me to write on it? What standards would you like me to write on the side of that carabiner? What strength would you like me to write on it? So basically, whatever they want, um, as long as it was, you know, within the realms of reason, that happily write it on that for me. And look, I rarely call out manufacturers, but there is, um, uh, the the I think it's a US company called Fusion Climb or something like that. They actually had a pulley on the market being sold on um, eBay and other places. What's the other Amazon and a few things like that. And it had all of the right markings on it, but it had rather than I can't remember the standard number EN12278 rather than EN12778. The standard number they printed on it was the, the standard for domestic pressure cookers rather than for pulleys. Right. But most users, they'll pick up that pulley and go, wow, it's even got an EN standard written on the side of it. It says it's this strong. It looks the same as the ones that are made by Kong or by someone else. It must be good. <clears throat> so again, with the proviso that I don't get paid by any manufacturers, I've never been paid by a manufacturer to say anything and, and never will. Um, I must, I must say, know your supplies, know your supply chain, buy, buy reputable products from reputable brands, particularly if you're doing activities that don't have the luxury of incorporating redundancy. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a pressure cooker. <laughs> uh, the ring for the leash. Go ahead. Someone's just asking a question there. But this this is probably outside of my my um, realm of understanding, um, having never never slacklined. Um, there's a link that's come up to the Vortex Highline ring from spiderslacklines.com. Um, can someone maybe put in words maybe what the question's about? Vortex from Spider. Do you know what the question? question might be asking yeah please ask the question i can show what it looks like what um what what the link is hey sarah thanks for being bumped to to slot me in at such short notice hey eh? <laughs> no problem so that's that's the ring that the question okay. is yep Okay, so it looks like it's a, um, here you go, here's another one of my short answers. <laughs> um, uh, maybe this is getting to the, 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 the core of this question, but Arata, I'm sure most of you have heard of this organization called Arata, um, the um, Industrial Rope Access Trade Association, uh, which is what many rope access technicians use as their certification scheme. Um, they were, they had to make a ruling for assessments a couple of years ago that everything from the technician to the anchor needs to needs to be double. So you have to have two of everything. And then someone said, does that include rigging plates? And then they said, don't ask that question. And then a couple of these young guys said, no, we need you to answer the question. Does it include rigging plates? And they said, look, if you're going to ask the question, you know what the answer is going to be. But they kept pushing. So then Arata came out with this statement that said, we've been asked to make this clarification. And here it is. Our system relies on double protection all the way from the technician to the anchor. That means during an assessment, if you use a single rigging plate, you will fail that assessment. Just by definition, not because of logic or because of engineering or any other reason, that's the system of work that Arata uses. My take on that, which, which I'm more than happy to explain over and over again, is any, any piece of equipment that has been designed for a particular purpose and has minimal opportunity for human misuse, I have no need to, to back up or provide redundancy. So, so a rigging plate that has nothing that opens and closes, um, and the, about the only thing that you could do wrong with it would be to load it over the edge of a structure and try and bend it in half, um, it, it, it's not going to fail. And if you do want to back it up, how are you going to back it up without weakening all of the connectors that you're putting in there? And if it's Look, they only write 36 kilonewtons on rigging plates because that's 
that's what they have to for the standard. But the reality is most of those rigging plates will hold 70 kilonewtons. Yeah. I broke a, of one of the big Petzl ones a little while ago, 78 kilonewtons it broke at. Yeah. So it's if it's got no moving parts, I'm, I'm completely happy with it. Um, if it has moving parts where humans can interfere with it and change it and put it together incorrectly, then for the systems that I work with, for critical components, um, I'm not happy with that as a single piece. Um, if that ring there that that opens it up sideways, if it can be opened and closed um, and side loaded and hung up and things, then maybe I wouldn't be so happy with it. Sarah's just saying, won't last long, a lot of leash falls, get sharp edges quickly, much the same with carabiners, carabiners being left on the top of sport climbs that are worked often. Um, there have been ropes cut because carabiners have become too sharp. Um, okay, I got the, okay, you can stop talking now, that's good. <laughs> Thumbs up. Um, yeah, I, I, I probably missed the question completely there, but no. Um, I probably should hand back to, to Sarah's next presentation at this point if there's no other outstanding questions. I will I will put in that um look um I, I think I think I can say maybe it's just because I'm getting older and my memory is getting a whole lot worse, but um if people take the time to send me an email, um Richard at ropelab.com.au, um I think I can honestly say I've answered every single technical question that people have sent me in the time that I've been doing this stuff. If you're gonna take the time to ask the question except for reading the standards, Thomas, but I've answered to say I haven't read them yet. <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> um, but, you know, or if I, I figure if people, Facebook messages I don't give the same priority to and Instagram messages are like way down there on the, on the list of significance. But if you take the time to write me an email and ask the question properly, um, particularly if you've got a nice drawn picture to explain it for, for me for something that I don't understand, then, then I will take the time to answer it. But, um, I'll probably wind up there. Hey, Kat and Sarah, thanks again for moving on, um, unless there's something else. Um, tiny, tiny, tiny question. Um, yeah. There's Pratt Rope Access Annual Meeting in February. Yeah. Um, can we go to that? What is it about? Do you want to tell a little bit about it? Okay, so Sprat, um, I, again, I, um, I, I'm, I'm certified as, as a technician under the Society of Professional Rope Access Technicians, Sprat. Sprat's in 42 countries around the world and we've got evaluators in 17 countries, I think, as well. Um, it's very similar to ERATA, except that it's technician-focused rather than company-focused. That's probably the main difference. We don't have company members, we have technician members. Um, our president is, is an hourly rate rope access technician. Um, I'm currently a board member of Sprat. I was elected to the board two years ago to, for a three-year term. Um, and I'm also an evaluator, an assessor for, for Sprat for technicians. Uh, each year we have our annual meeting, um, and much like you guys have done here, we're we're struggling with uh, the face-to-face -face meeting isn't going to happen. It can't happen, so we have to find other ways to do it. So we will be having uh, the online annual meeting, and as part of that meeting, look, there's general business, which is pretty boring and talking about standards and certification and competence and the way we do things, but there's often also a presentation schedule where um, people far more professional than me who take the time and come up with really slick presentations um, about different things like what happens if you fall on two ASAPs at the same time, you've got those two six kilometer shock packs right next to each other or you know, all, all of those sort of things. Could, um, or, or why do we need independent assessment for, for people doing sort of all, all those sort of things. So there's, there's an interesting presentation schedule as well. Traditionally, the face-to-face -face, um, meetings have been open to anyone with an attendance fee. Um, the online one, we haven't got the format sorted out yet. Um, but you know, I, I, as as a board member who's really trying to support the international flavour of Sprat, um, I'd I'd love that that presentation side of it was was open to anyone that registered. Um, but that's that's something that I, I'm certainly I have on my agenda to take to the board meeting discussing that stuff. There you go, Cat. <laughs> it's rope access stuff. It can be pretty dry. <clears throat> Presentations sound good, especially if they'll have pictures and everything. So. All that stuff, yeah. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Thanks for the invitation, guys. Thanks for what you guys are doing with um, with your stuff too, hey.